This video will use functional variation to determine the minimum energy of a determinant of spin orbitals as needed to compute the energy in Hartree-Fock theory. All right, so we'll start off with some uh, wave function, which is a ground state determinant of a bunch of spin orbitals. So we have electrons one through n and spin orbitals one through n, which are occupied in a determinant of them something we might indicate in a shorthand as 1, 2, all the way up to n. And a and b just represent any two particular spin orbitals uh, within those pairs from 1 to n. All right, so this energy then is going to be a functional of all of those spin orbitals. Each spin orbital has uh, spatial coordinates x, y, and z, as well as a spin coordinate alpha or beta and the value of these spin orbitals at every function in space for all of the spin orbitals in aggregate is that what determines this energy. And that energy is equal to the expectation value integral of the complex conjugate of that determinant times the Hamiltonian total energy operator acting on that wave function determinant. And then this will be integrated with respect to all variables of the system in this case, if there are n electrons, there would be 4n total variables, 3n spatial coordinates, x, y, and z for each of the electrons, uh, and a spin coordinate uh, for each of the electrons as well. So according to the variational principle, we want to minimize the energy with respect to the spin orbitals to get the best possible approximation to the true ground state energy of this system. And in order to do that, we're also going to have to enforce the constraint that uh, starting out that our orbitals should be orthonormal to one another, and we will enforce a constraint as we, as we deviate away from that. So the integral over the coordinates of electron 1 of the overlap of spin orbital A and spin orbital B, chi star A, chi B, complex conjugate of spin orbital A, that's going to be equal to this uh, chemist notation Dirac integral here, AB. Notice I'm using the square brackets for the chemist notation. That doesn't matter yet for the one electron integrals, but it is going to matter down below here for the two electron integrals. And of course, if they are orthonormal to one another, that means they are both uh, orthogonal, so zero when A does not equal to B, and one when A does equal B which can be expressed in terms of the Kronecker delta, delta AB. So our Lagrangian then is going to be a functional of the set of all of these spin orbitals, which is going to be the total energy minus a penalty for any deviations away from orthonormality. So we have a sum over from A equals one to N, B equals one to N, a pair, double sum over all of the orbitals there of epsilon AB, a matrix of Lagrange multipliers, times the overlap of A and B minus the Kronecker delta. So if our energy is decreasing because of just changes in the orbitals, that's going to be fine. But if it's decreasing just due to non-orthonormality or changes in uh, normalization, then that's going to be penalized in the second term here. All right, so what is this energy term going to be? That's just going to be our Hartree-Fock energy expression, which will be a sum over all of the electrons of the one electron energy of that spin orbital, kinetic energy plus attraction to all nuclei. Plus, and then we're going to have the, pair, the pairwise interaction of all electrons or of all pairwise electron repulsion of all spin orbitals, Coulomb integral AABB, minus exchange integral ABBA, classical electrostatic repulsion of charge density of electron 1 in spin orbital A and charge density of electron 2 in spin orbital B, and then of course the non-classical exchange term. And now instead of writing this as a pairwise sum, I've written it as a double sum with a one-half out in front. Um, this is going to work because in a full double sum, each of these pairs is going to appear twice, hence the one-half. And along the diagonal, where A equals B, that's going to cancel out. Because if A equals B, then we would have AAAA, which would get exactly canceled out when we subtract by AAAA again. So this is, in fact, equivalent to the pairwise uh, sums that we've been doing thus far in this chapter. 
Additionally of note is that this Lagrangian is going to be real. And it's real because our energy is a physical property. It's an observable, meaning that it has to be a real number. It wouldn't make sense to have an imaginary energy or any other physical property. So in order for this energy to be real and also for um, the second term to end up being real as well, uh, it needs to be the case that this matrix of Lagrange multipliers is going to be Hermitian, meaning that um, if we take the transpose of the matrix, then it's going to equal the complex conjugate of the original, or epsilon AB equals epsilon BA star. Okay, so starting out with our variations, if we take spin orbital A and we vary it to be spin orbital A plus the first variation in spin orbital A, sort of like a kind of infinitesimal first derivative type situation, then we're going to have the variation in the Lagrangian, which has to be equal to zero if we're minimizing the energy with respect to the spin orbitals, just like a first derivative in calculus. Um, the only critical points of the function appear whenever your first derivative is zero. We're also assuming that it's a minimum here, which is usually a pretty good assumption, but not, not ironclad until you look at the second derivative. But for now, let's just focus on this first derivative. So we have this variation in our Lagrangian is going to be the variation in the energy minus the double sum of the Lagrange multipliers times the variation in the uh, spin orbital overlap integrals. And this entire thing has to end up being equal to zero. Okay, so if we break down those terms, we get the variation in the energy is going to be a sum over all of the orbitals of the variation in our one electron energy. Uh, you can vary this orbital or that one. So product rule, we get the sum of both. And then for our two electron energy, we have four cases we could vary for each of those integrals. So in a product rule for four variables, we do each of those four, holding the other three constant in the terms. So eight total terms for the two electron integrals. And we can also note that there is a kind of permutational symmetry in these, in these uh, integrals here, that electron 1 is on the left-hand side, electron 2 on the right, and those are just dummy indices, so we can exchange AA for BB. So that's going to be uh, delta AA BB is equal to BB delta AA. Additionally, we can flip uh, which one is the complex conjugate and which one is the orbital for both sides as well and get the complex conjugate of the result. So BB delta AA is actually equal to A, is actually equal to, I would say, BB A delta A, this one over there. So, and then through the transitive property, all four of these end up being equal to one another where we can exchange electron one and electron two as we do here and also here. Or we can exchange the complex conjugate and spin orbital as we do there and as we do there, uh, noting that we get the complex conjugate as a result. Okay, and then for our other term, what about the variations in this term? Well, here we have product rule as well, just two terms to worry about, A and B. So we can vary A or we can vary B. And then note also that I can make this substitution, that I'm going to keep the first term the same and then split up the sum. But A and B, again, are both sort of just dummy indices, and I'm doing a double sum over both of them. So I'm actually going to swap B and A here. So A goes to B, B goes to A, and then uh, AB goes to BA. So we get this result here. And then also note that I mentioned that the Lagrange multipliers are Hermitian, so EBA equals EAB star, as I then substitute on the next line. And also, additionally, for this overlap integral, the integral of B star delta A would be equal to the uh, complex conjugate of uh, delta A star B. So I can fill, factor this term in this way which once I factor out the complex conjugate to the outside, we note is just the complex conjugate of the first term. So I can do a similar type of thing when I'm looking at the Lagrangian of the energy terms uh, for this term and that term. Um, I can actually just show that those are complex conjugates of one another. Similarly, for the eight terms in my two electron integrals there, I can uh, factor those 
and uh, factor those and bring two of them together due to permutational symmetry in the following type of way there, where those are just complex conjugates of one another. And additionally, then, on the, on the term that I, that I brought down there, I note that these two are complex conjugates. Okay, so if either of, so this is sort of two separate terms here. We have the terms with the non-complex conjugates and the terms with them. And these have to be equal to zero. So any one of these groups individually being equal to zero means the complex conjugate would also be equal to zero. So it's sufficient just to consider uh, one of these sets of terms here to prove that it has to be equal to zero. Okay, so if I look at just one of these uh, sets of terms then, then I note that this is actually similar to an, an expression of the following form if I refactor this. It's the sum a equals one to n, as each term has, of the integral of elect with respect to electron one, of the variation of, of orbital spin orbital a star, as we have in each of these uh, four integrals here, of, and then we have the operator, the one electron operator, as we have there, plus sum b equals one to n, as we have in the second two terms, of Coulomb minus exchange operator, which when acting on uh, spin orbital a will give us these two, uh, these two Coulomb and exchange integrals. And then the term we're subtracting there is the sum over from b equals one to n of this last term of epsilon a b uh, chi, chi b, uh, which when multiplied by chi star a gives us this integral up there. So it really means that this term, or this integral that we've got, is going to have to end up being equal to zero. Or similarly, if I take this term, which is negative, and move it to the other side, that means this term has to equal that term. So I have h1 uh, plus the sum over all spin orbitals of Coulomb minus exchange operator acting on uh, chi a. But that has to equal a sum from b equals 1 to n of the Lagrange multiplier epsilon a b to acting on orbital b. So if you've been paying attention here, you might notice that this is actually the Fock operator. This is the Fock operator for electron 1 acting on uh, spin orbital a. So I might indicate a f chi a there. And this is equal to the sum from b equals 1 to n epsilon a b chi b. So um, this is what we call the non-canonical form of the hartree fock equations. This is going to be the first step of what we're using on our way to actually getting the, what the full hartree fock equations are. So our next step is to take this form, which is slightly inconvenient because we don't like the sum and what's going on here, and to figure out how to get this into a form which looks something much more like an eigenvalue equation or a pseudo-eigenvalue equation that we can solve to get what our spin orbitals need to be in order to get the lowest energy uh, Hartree-Fock ground state determinant, which will be the best approximation we can get to the true ground state wave function.